Intro. Erin. Hi, my name's Erin. Talissa. Hi, I'm Talissa. Erin, smile at camera. Talissa, smile at camera three. Erin and Talissa, ad lib. <laughs> this is Studio 20 Live. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us. We have a huge lineup today on our show. We sure do. We've also got a Studio 20 Live exclusive. It is the premiere of a new film called Polar Bear. It's the trailer we've got for you today, and that's from some University of Wollongong students. So it's pretty exciting. Yeah, speaking of talented students, our boys from Pop Up have another premiere this week. And the topic for this week's video is social media celebrities. I'm super excited for that. Why would you be excited um, about that? Actually, thank you, Erin. I am two followers off 600 on Instagram, and I haven't been on in three months. Yes, so all about the followers. Hashtag living for my fans. Yes, and speaking of hashtags, don't forget to hashtag Studio 20 Live throughout our show today. That's right. We'd like to hear from you. Definitely. We've also got a great segment today, My Kitchen Go Rules. This week, we've got a gem from the Studio 20 family uh, doing the Kitchen uh, Go Rules segment. He has been to the kitchens of New York, the kitchens of building. 25 and now he's heading to the kitchens of building 19 so very excited to see what yes. he's got for us he's certainly become quite the global chef he is the global chef yes. but first up on today's show we have the news what's been making headlines this week john thanks guys concerns have been raised about the social media response to the death of robin williams this week some experts believe that a tweet posted by the organization behind the academy awards may lead to instances of copycat suicides by presenting suicide as liberating the tweet which has been retweeted over 300,000 times, features a photo of Williams's character Genie from the movie Aladdin being freed from a lamp, along with a quote, Genie, you're free. Anyone looking for support or information about suicide can contact Lifeline on 13 1114 or Beyond Blue on 13 4636. The damage caused by bushfires in Australia is well known around the world, but UAW researchers have found that some residents in fire-prone communities aren't able to take the action necessary to avoid a loss of life and a loss of property. While householders understand the risks posed by living in or near bushland, the researchers suggest a lack of resources and underestimation of fire proximity means people are not always able to reduce the hazardous fuels close to their properties. Ever felt unsafe in Wollongong? A survey being conducted by Wollongong City Council is aiming to find out whether residents, students and workers feel safe in the local area. Respondents are asked how safe they feel while doing activities near where they work, live or study, and how, also how they feel about safety in the Wollongong CBD. The council says it will use the results to make improvements and help reduce crime. Gardens of the Galaxy has stormed the box office in Australia and the world, taking in almost $9 million locally and $319 million worldwide. The same can't be said for Australian apocalyptic drama film These Final Hours which has made just $388,000 since it was released two weeks ago, despite being well received by critics. And finally today, an airstrike by Israel's military has followed an extension to the ceasefire agreement between Israel and Palestine in Gaza. And that's what's making news today. Thanks, guys. And now staying on the topic of Gaza, this week we've decided to delve really headfirst into the conflict to further understand what's happening with the situation. The Gaza Strip is located between Egypt and the Mediterranean Sea, densely populated with 1.8 million people living within just 224 square kilometres. Since 2007, the area has been under the control of the militant group Hamas when they formed a unity government with the Palestinian political faction Fatah. Conflict between Israel and Gaza has been going on for at least 100 years. However, after a two-year calm period, tensions were reignited about two months ago when three Israeli teenagers were captured and killed whilst hitchhiking in the West Bank. Whilst Hamas have denied their involvement in the kidnapping of the three teens, Israeli militant forces went on to arrest more than 300 Palestinians and raid more than 1,000 private homes. Both sides have been at arms since early July with rockets and air raids becoming a daily occurrence. In just four weeks of conflict, 1,423 Gazans and 59 Israelis have died. 
As of the 31st of July, a quarter of Gaza's population had been displaced and over 225,000 Palestinians are still seeking refuge in 86 United Nations shelters. It's obvious that the conflict in Gaza is an extremely sensitive and complicated situation. So we're joined by Professor Gregory Rose, who's going to help us understand a little bit more. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Talisa. Now, Greg, you've got quite an extensive knowledge on the conflict. But um, as university students, whilst many of us are aware of what's going on, there's a lot of the finer details that we're not too sure of. Is there any chance you could just break it down a bit for us? Sure. Thanks, Erin. Well, I suppose to put it into context, as your introduction uh, indicated, uh, Gaza is located between Egypt and the Mediterranean Sea, although it didn't mention also Israel. So there are borders with both Israel and Egypt. The current conflict has its antecedents in um, the firing of rockets at Israel. I think about 14,000 have been fired since 2001. Uh, 4,000 during the current conflict over the last month, um, another 5,000 since 2009. Hamas took over in Gaza in 2007. That's a bit of general background, but I think the current conflict actually was triggered uh, by the change of government in Egypt. So Hamas is a, an Islamist or militarist organisation uh, banned as a terrorist organisation in Europe, uh, Australia, Canada, US, mm -hmm. um, and comparable to Al Qaeda or the Islamic State in uh, Iraq and Syria. So you're looking at a fairly extreme kind of ideology mm -hmm. uh, in order to impose Sharia. And the violence in Gaza was being exported into Sinai with attacks on dozens of uh, Egyptian troops in mm -hmm. Sinai. And when people came out onto the streets again in Cairo against uh, the Muslim Brotherhood government of uh, President Morsi, and he was ousted by the military and then the current president, Sisi, was uh, elected, the Sisi government has closed about... Um, I think it's uh, 1,700 tunnels into uh, Egypt, into Sinai. Mm -hmm. That has had a dramatically um, breaking effect on the uh, Gazan economy. It was tolerated under President Mubarak uh, because there was plenty of bakshish, plenty of money coming into the army through the taxes that were imposed on this trade. But the CC government is trying to hold on to Sinai uh, and prevent its control from slipping into the hands of Al-Qaeda-related organisations that yeah. are affiliated with Hamas. So they have closed uh, the tunnels. Mm -hmm. yeah. That puts Hamas in a really difficult situation. They, uh, they're already not economically vibrant. They're less politically popular. They were elected in 2006. Mm -hmm. uh, as part of the Palestinian Authority, then throughout the Palestinian Authority in a coup which murdered about 700 people in 2007, and so they've been ruling since 2007. And if their popularity at home declines and the economy at home declines, and they don't have any access to trade through Egypt anymore, yeah. the opportunity to regain both political support and uh, trade advantages is by pressure on Israel, so that accounted for the uh, sudden escalation in rocket attacks mm -hmm. and Israel's response. Yep, of course. So um, you've said that Hamas are obviously in power in Gaza. Uh, now, they've come out and said that they've been using things like drones for surveillance uh, and intelligence, as well as firing um, munition. So obviously, both sides are using advancing technologies. What does that mean? And, and what can you explain what the drones are that they, they're using? Drones are... Um not quite the Star Wars drones, mm -hmm. <laughs> they're unmanned aerial vehicles. Mm -hmm. So you know how you can have a servo-controlled little petrol engine aeroplane? Mm -hmm. They're like that, but with cameras installed or with munitions installed, and they can range from the size of an aeroplane that you would launch in the local park, about that big, yep. to something that is, uh, I don't know, 20 metres long wow, and okay. can stay aloft for three days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, they're used extensively uh, now in uh, the US military, in Israel, in India, China, Russia, ma all major militaries use unmanned aerial vehicles. They're going to become uh, the replacement for piloted vehicles in many instances. What do you think that means for the conflict zones though, that the fact that they are unmanned now and that these technologies are advancing obviously quite quickly to the point where you said they can stay in the air for up to three days. What does that mean for the people on the ground and, and the people on both sides? It means an informal arms race like there was in the Cold War where technologies are trying to keep up or leapfrog mm -hmm. each other. Uh, Hamas's uh, use of, zone, of drones has been very limited, though. Yep. They've only uh, launched a few into Israeli territory, which have been shot down. Mm -hmm. I think Israel has far advanced uh, mm -hmm. drone technology. Of course. Yeah, and it, back to the civilians. You know, many have had to go into the UN, UN um, shelters. shelters. What, what's, what's happening now and what's going to happen to those people, you know, who's, who's taking care of that? Well, those shelters are actually schools, schools yeah. and halls, mm -hmm. uh, basically, where uh, bedding and other uh, provisions have been uh, provided by the, mostly by uh, the UN Works and Relief Agency for Palestinians, which is the only UN organisation dedicated to a particular group of people. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it tends to be relatively generously funded, uh, given its specialty mission, uh, with about, I think, a quarter of a billion from the EU and a bit more than that from the US, plus Japanese and other funding. Australia has committed uh, several million to Gaza relief, but the damage that's been done is huge. Yeah. Uh, the estimated cost for reconstruction is $5 billion. The cost of the conflict to Israel, it present is estimated at $3 billion. Mm -hmm. And in fact, on the Israeli side of the border, there are about 300,000 displaced people as well. Okay. Uh, now, where to from here? I know there's peace talks in Cairo. Things are starting to move in the right direction with a three-day ceasefire. Mm -hmm. um, where do you see this going from here and how, how can we end this conflict? Well, we always look for solutions mm -hmm. and we hope that there is one. This conflict has been going on for almost 100 years. Yeah. Uh, Lieutenant General Peter Lee, who was head of the Australian Army, described this as the start of a hundred year war. Uh, not the Israel Gaza conflict specifically, but uh, Islamist versus uh, Western secular uh, values. Mm -hmm. So uh, I suspect that a solution that will resolve all the issues is some time off. However, the current truce, the, today's news has been extended by five days, despite a flare up this morning when some rockets were fired. Uh, and uh, according to the reports that are coming out from the negotiators, they've covered 95% of the bases uh, towards achieving a long-term truce, not mm -hmm. a permanent yeah. solution. Uh, and included in the proposals are a <laughs> Gaza via Lanaka in Cyprus. So there'd be a checking point mm -hmm. in Cyprus because in the past, uh, advanced missiles have been coming in via ship, uh, largely through off, um, through the Suez Canal and funded and provided by Iran or sometimes through Lebanon uh, via Syria. Um, an easing of border restrictions so as to allow more Gazans into Israel and into Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, Israel is looking for demilitarization in the Gaza Strip as part of a long-term solution, which Hamas has been uh, refusing, saying the resistance is uh, the um, absolute necessity uh, for the organization. But you know, they may find a, some role for compromise when it comes mm -hmm. to rearming. The main issue for Israel was the um, building of tunnels. I think uh, 34 tunnels mm -hmm. were found and destroyed. Um, many of which actually entered into Israel. Most of the casualties of Israeli soldiers were through surprise attacks that uh, appeared f from tunnel openings mm -hmm. in Israel. You might remember that uh, a few years ago, a soldier named Gilad Shalit was kidnapped and held captive in Gaza for five years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in the deal for his release, uh, 
1,200 uh, Hamas and other Palestinian operatives were released. So he was actually captured as a result of a successful tunnel exploit. That was the first one. Mm -hmm. right. uh, and so the idea was to conduct simultaneous major raids during the Jewish New Year in September uh, this year. And in these tunnels they found uh, a range of equipment including motorbikes, syringes, sedatives, wow. uh, you know, the plastic straps for binding people up, mm -hmm. the objective being to take more uh, uh, captives for a kidnap ransom. Mm. So that was the main immediate threat yep. that's been addressed. There's now talk in Israel of trying to develop technology that will identify tunnels mm -hmm. uh, so as to avoid the necessity of a major land operation. To some extent, uh, I know this sounds dramatic, but uh, parts of Gaza, uh, in Gaza City, are rigged up like a suicide bomber would be, mm -hmm. with uh, reports of some streets where you had a majority of the houses booby-trapped. So you send in your ground troops and uh, they're detonated, together mm -hmm. with a huge amount of damage. Yeah. that occurs internally. I mean, about 5% of the rockets actually landed in Gaza rather than in Israel. Mm -hmm. um, but the main objective, uh, short-term objective from the Israeli perspective was to demolish the tunnels. Mm -hmm. uh, and of an estimated 10,000 rockets uh, in stock, 4,000 were fired, 3,000 were destroyed, and it's believed that 3,000 are still in stock in various tunnels within the network. The main subterranean network in the centre of um, Gaza City, particularly under the Al-Shifa Hospital, which has been used as a sort of a civilian shield mm -hmm. against the infrastructure, uh, continues and that's where the Hamas leadership has remained. Interestingly, there were no, no bomb shelters or any protection provided for the civilian population mm -hmm. in the context of this planned um, attack and yeah. expected uh, response. So obviously it's, it's a very complex situation. There's no easy way to kind of solve this type of thing. Uh, we thank you very much for coming on the show today. It's really helped us o uh, understand what's going on. And it's, it's been great to have you really break it down and really just refine everything that's been going on. Does that mean <coughs> that you're going to untie me from the seat? <laughs> yes, we'll untie you from the seat and let you go now. But yeah, it's been really great to have you on the show. Yeah, thank you for um, and I hope that that's uh, cleared a few things up for the students out there um, who understand more about the situation now. Thank you. It's great to be here. <laughs> thank you. Now, Brittany has been mm. busy on campus covering Live Art Week, which has been a great opportunity for students and artists alike to j come onto campus and just express their artistic talents. Um, so yeah, let's check out what Brittany got to see this week. UAW hosted its first Live Art Week this Monday and Tuesday, showcasing emerging artists in an interactive live art space. Students were able to approach and watch some of our local talents in action, challenging previous artists' practice and exhibition conventions where the public is only shown the finished product. Kayla Berry, the entertainment organiser at Uni Centre, said the week's activities provided students interested in art but studying other degrees with an outlet to express themselves. Uh, the whole vibe of Live Art Week and the whole idea around this event is for people to be creative, you know, um, step out of their books a little bit. Crowd favourite Mulga was there too, encouraging passers-by to paint with him. Yeah, a girl came up before who'd wrote a poem for one of my artworks. I got people to write poems on Instagram sometimes and I wrote it up and she came. Joel Tonks, UOW Honours Student and Artist, said he thought the event was successful. Yeah, I think the campus really lacks that in a lot of ways, that um, a lot of people think they can't do art, and this is kind of trying to get people involved and show that they can be part of it. Origami, henna tattooing, and free access to a range of watercolour paints and pencils saw UOW embrace its inner Picasso over the two-day show. Organisers say they hope the event will be continued annually. So this is the first year we've done an event like this, so we're really hoping um, to continue the event every year. Brittany Carter, UOW TV. Very exciting stuff for Live Art Week. Definitely. Lots of talent on campus. That's right. And it was so strange to go around on Wednesday. And we spoke to a few of the artists, Erin and I. Uh, and 
most of them, not most of them, but a lot of them weren't even art students. Some of them were in fact, you know, history students or sociology majors. There's some real hidden gems out there in the art world and it's yep. really, really, really great Definitely. Stuff. And while we are, you know, after we just saw the lovely Brittany um, mm -hmm. covering that story, Brittany also is a co-editor of the Turton Gala, which is the campus magazine, which features an article all about Studio 20 Live, which we are very <laughs> honoured to have so thanks to Brittany for that little shout out and make but sure yeah don't forget to grab your own copy of the Turton Gala environment issue which is out now right that's right you can grab it all around campus it is put in a number of different spots and make sure you have a look at that now uh, now it's time for my favorite segment of the show it's time to cook something yummy up and it's time for my kitchen go rules with Kevin Hello and welcome to My Kitchen Go Rules, today inside Building 19. Today I'm going to be teaching you how to make fast and cheap noodles. First, you're going to be needing a cup, noodles, $1.30 at the uni shop, seasoning and a fork. First step, you're going to have to put the noodles and cut it in half and put it inside this cup. Next, you're going to have to fill it to the top with water. Once that's done, put it inside a microwave for two minutes. Once that's done, take out the cup and make sure that it gets a good stir so that all of it is in the hot water. Once that's done, take the cup of noodles, put it back inside the microwave again. This time, for one minute. One minute, take it out again. Give it another good stir. Then drain the water out of the noodles. Once the water has been drained from the noodles, open up the satchel that came with the noodles, empty the contents into the noodles, and stir it again. Once you're done, enjoy! Back to you guys in the studio. I'm Jordan. I'm Reese. We're the directors of Polar Bear. Polar Bear is a dramatic short film about a budding relationship that quickly falls into a downward spiral. Uh, this is the trailer. Hope you enjoy. Look at him. He's so blind. Now he's acting like they're just friends, but you just have to look a little closer and you can tell, aren't they? They're more than that. Now that film's in its final stages of editing. That's right, those two UOW students will be entering that into all the summer film festivals, so I am very, very keen to see how that will do. Um, that's from It's Got Stealth Productions as well. So if you'd like to check out their website for other things like that, trailers and movies as well, uh, it's at the bottom of the screen now. And speaking of talented students, our boys from Pop Up have another great video to be premiered on our show exclusively. The topic is social media celebrities. Yeah. So let's see what our lovely students on campus had to say about that topic. Hey. 
They've gone wild. Sean, my followers have gone wild. What are you talking about? I posted a selfie hashtag no filter and it went viral. Now my followers are chasing me. There's no one here. second person sort it out on the internet. I think it's a it's a pretty smart way of just networking yourself. I think it's good, like you can find people from that like would never have a chance to go somewhere big. It's like global, it's not just like locally Australian, you can just like go worldwide. I think it's I think it's good like um breaking down barriers for people to be able to do stuff. I have nothing wrong with using social media because like I use it. I have a lot of social media and stuff but I'm not there to get popular I'm just there to use this stuff. I think it's good, like it's out there, so why not utilise it? I don't blog to get famous, I just blog because I blog. Deserve it? Yeah. Um, yeah, why not? Some of them, yeah. I don't think so. Just if they're really talented. It depends, like are they doing something worthwhile to get famous, or are they literally just using the internet to get famous? Good for them. They're doing a good job at it? <laughs> Absolutely. 100%. I think they have nothing better to do with their days, really, is what it comes down to. Becoming famous doesn't look too easy, so if they're doing it, it's a good job. They want to get famous online, then they got nothing better to do, basically. If you have that sort of charisma as a person, then you deserve, like, all the celebrity status you get because you're likeable and you're doing something good. Well, there's, like, a lot of beauty gurus who've, like, made their way. Lauren Curtis, the Australian makeup chick. She's the number one YouTube makeup subscribed person in Australia. She's earned it. Some do, some have worked hard, but some haven't. Probably Justin Bieber, who was one of those. <laughs> People that are doing blinds and stuff like that. Like, I feel like, example, Kim Kardashian, she's such a cop out. Like, she's not even famous for the real reason. Celebrities like the Kardashians, you know, they're born into it. This girl, Acacia Brindley, um, she's famous for putting her nudes up on Tumblr when she was like 14. If you get famous on the internet and then, like, you decide to do something with that fame, that's when you're like, you know what, you're a good person. No, I don't have a problem with that because, like, they're following a passion. But other than that, it's like, what are you doing? But I don't consider posting selfies to get famous. Kurt Coleman. Like um, Kurt Coleman? Anyone can get in front of a camera and say that they love themselves. I think he's just a really fake person. He carries on like an absolute pork child. Why do you think he's got such a big following? Um, because he's a bit bitchy and doesn't care what anyone... Can I say bitchy? Yeah, yeah. So you want. Okay. <laughs> I don't understand what's so bad about people getting in front of camera and saying they love themselves. I love myself. Yeah, we know. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is a very interesting topic at the moment. But I also think that particularly Instagram lately is a great way for brands and like big brands, even individual like no Starting name brands. Up yeah, totally. It's a great way. Social media is a great way to get your marketing out there. Exactly. And, and I think that um, people can be a brand as well. Think of people like Kurt Coleman. He's been on all the different news channels. He's got uh, possibly a TV show coming out, all because he started from social media. So I don't think that's such a bad <clears> yes. thing. Yes, yes, yes. Well, we could rant about this all day, <laughs> or we could go and visit Angie. The topic for this week's rant is blinkers. Let's just play the video because I don't want to get too fired up about this topic. I can feel it. guys, this is a rant about problems on the road. People on the road who don't use their blinkers, who change lanes or turn, you all deserve a special place in hell. It's like it's right next to your hand. It's like ten sec it's like a second of your life, just turn the blinker signal. Helps me out. Help a brother out. I completely agree with that guy. Yep. Um, if you weren't meant to use an indicator, they wouldn't have put it exactly. in your car. So exactly. So use that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's about all we've got time for. But before we go, we're going to hear from a very, very talented young lady. Her name is Melanie April, and she's going to be singing one of her original songs called Exile.
smile hung upon him. I said, I'm on my own, my one and only friend. I never came up against him. Howling at the moon, everything so He's coming for me The ringing of the bells Breach the town The half moon howler Taught them to sing The children pity ones Filled with laughter, but he taught them his song. Ooh, 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 ooh. He's coming for me. Be afraid of the night I'll stay safe beneath my sheets But there was a plague within my sleep I'm feeling all so pressured by these crooked smiles I'm losing my identity, losing my identity Whoa, 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 whoa Bottom dollar is coming for you. And now I run, run from the sound of his gun, tattered and torn, bruised and forlorn. And now I run, run from the sound of his gun, tattered and torn, bruised and forlorn. And now I'm running, 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 running away. And now I'm running, 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 running. Dripping into the dripping, dripping of the hole in his soul, so shallow and cold. Thank you. Beautiful that voice. Awesome. Wonderful. Now, yeah, so now the name of the song was Exile. It's a pretty strong name for a song. What was the inspiration behind that? Um, at the time, I wasn't really sure what I was doing myself, and I guess I was just struggling with peer pressure mm -hmm. and all those kind of things. It was, yeah, it was a while back, but mm -hmm. I definitely doesn't does resonate today as mm -hmm. well. Beautiful yep. Voice. So you're a student at University of Wollongong. Yeah, what yeah. are you studying? I'm doing an arts. Um, I'm doing arts, um, but I do music as an elective, and that's really really 
Because they took that away, didn't they? And now they've brought it back. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, they started it up this year, and um, I'm really happy. I've made a lot of connections. It's really good. That's excellent. And so, do you have a YouTube account? I don't or? have a YouTube, but I do have Facebook, Facebook. and SoundCloud. Excellent. And all those kind of things. Awesome. Yeah, cool. That's where we can find you. Uh, yeah, and so we understand that music runs through your family. Your brother was in band comp the other night. Now here you are. Yeah. Um, where where can we see you? You've, as, play any gigs around Wollongong? I have played a couple, like I played at Alibi and I'm looking forward to trying to get myself out there. Mm -hmm. I haven't really been looking lately, but I will. I definitely will. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. definitely. And I guess we got updated that with the Facebook page once we all like that for you. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. Alrighty. Excellent. Well, that's all we've got time for today, guys. But don't forget that this Saturday is Open Day, which is the first of its kind on the Uni University of Wollongong campus. Since 97. Since so. 97, sorry. And it's from 10 till 4 this Saturday. So if you know of anybody that's thinking of coming to learn at the University of Wollongong, there's plenty of activities, plenty of people to talk to. Pretty much everyone, someone from every fac faculty will be there for a chat. So right. come check it out if you're free, if you're in the neighbourhood. Why um, not? But yeah, but thanks so much for joining us this week. My name's Erin. And I'm Talissa. And we'll see you next time on Studio 20 Live.